So this event has been graciously offered to me by the two visionary creators of this series, my friend Larry, who unfortunately cannot be here today, and her wonderful wife, Liza, not very long ago my student, but now my teacher in creative musicianship, dedication, humility, excellence, and many, many more things. Offered to me, as I say, to give a presentation just about any topic that happens to excite me currently and which I would gladly share with any and all who would honor me this afternoon with their presence. Well, it is you, all of you, now facing me. My text here says, and possibly a few more who are yet to arrive, but I don't believe people will be that late anymore. So it is you who turned out to be those people. I must acknowledge that you all have performed a remarkable leap of faith by being here, and I would like to reward you for this in kind. I myself decided, and that was a risky decision in a way, to enact a veritable leap of faith in my choice of what subject I would attempt to address, and more importantly, how I would do that. I used to think of myself primarily as a scholar of music, a musicologist. I no longer do. Simply, wow, you see, I'm glad I read that little phrase there. Thank you for coming, guys. So I just said that I'm very appreciative that you guys came here to listen to me, and I think that that's a veritable act of faith on your part, and I would like to do the same for you in return. And what I'm doing also takes a lot of faith and a lot of courage on my part. So I used to think of myself as a musicologist, but I no longer do simply because scholarship, as it is commonly understood and practiced, does not excite me as much as it used to. Music still does, more than it ever has. So therefore, I will now launch the vessel of my thought onto an uncharted sea of meaning that has remained largely opaque to our rather clueless, collectively self-imprisoned intellect. I have long I've long since sensed certain crucial configurations of gestalts of significance within this neglected sea of meaning to which I believe only music can provide for us anything resembling direct access. I'm convinced, in other words, that it is only by focusing attention upon some archetypal aspects of music's universal organizational patterns through the lens of certain carefully chosen specific phenomena within our musical heritage in the West, in which, from our cultural perspective at least, those aspects seem to converge and culminate, that we can hope to unlock those deeper configurations for our comprehension. I invite you on this journey, but with this warning. The outcome is entirely unpredictable. And I mean this because when I say I launch my vessel now, I refer not only to this moment you and I jointly inhabit here, but also to a now that is at this point nine days in our past, on the day of this year's fall equinox. Mm. And as I conceive these very words, I truly have no clear idea as to how it will all turn out. There are no guarantees. I have taken the risk and liberty to do this because this venue, this kind of Saturday afternoon event, doesn't connote for me a buttoned-up lecturing atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing a tie, but you say I'm not buttoned up. Mm -hmm. I'm not lying here. I just like ties. One of my weaknesses. So this place and time, this is a place and time, rather, to unveil new fruits of creativity. I might have done that here more than once before. And that's what I will attempt once again today. Not through a recent musical composition of mine, but by tackling a musical and at the same time also meta-musical puzzle that I haven't quite figured out yet, but hope to do so with the very help of your own leap of faith. Will you stay on board? If you do, then let the journey begin. Let me insert at this point that 
I turned out to be very right about this. As I was working feverishly on this, after many, many weeks of thinking, of course, but trying to commit it to a format which I can then read to you, somewhere around the fifth day, I have doubts that I can keep on going and write this to the end and still be able to read it to you. I realized that many things that in writing, even if it is not formal, even if it is not scholarly in the ways I describe, things have to be clear, things have to, like what you write down, you feel you're very responsible about. And yes, this approach, this, this uh, experiment is so experimental that I realized if I want to be able to convey some of it faithfully, I will have to stop the writing because that doesn't take me there. I will read and do my stuff as I planned up to a certain point, then stop there and depending on how we all are doing, we'll keep going without the written text and see how far that takes us. Before setting sail, let me introduce and describe in some detail those notable moments of Western music history I have in mind. Being as they are relatively familiar to most of us present, that's an assumption on my part, so correct me if it's not so, they will best serve for anchoring our attention and help poise our vessel for launching. Bach's unforgettable unfinished fugue on the letters of his name is the first. Contrapunctus number 14 was planned as the crowning achievement of Bach's unsurpassed art of fugue, an ambitious synthesis into a single fourfold movement of four distinct fugues, each based on its own subject, designed for ultimate combining with the other three. Glad I didn't destroy that. I'll be more careful. I'll just show you quickly the subjects. The first is... This is not directly on your page. That's the first. Could you hear it? Yes. Uh, the second one is... One you will hear soon because this is our subject. The last one, as it turns out, it's not proposed, it's not in the score, I will say more about that, but it was supposed to be the subject which is the master subject of the entire collection of fugues, and that is. on these keyboards is very unpredictable. You can't really fine-tune your dynamics easily. The last fourth fugue is missing in the first printed edition for obscure and much debated reasons. The third fugue, the one based on the B-A-C-H subject, I will not say more about this, but is it somewhat clear how a collection of letters that make up a name in this case can be turned into a musical theme? We use letters for note names, so some of those letters match. It just so happens that Bach's name is composed of letters that in the German tradition all of them can be seen as note names. So that's how that fugue subject came about. So the third fugue, the one based on the BACH subject, just reaches the point of the first threefold combination with the previous themes before tra trailing off mid-measure into silence, a silence that was portrayed in the Art of Fugue's original publication as Bach's final. 
silence from which he could never talk to us anymore. Even though not finished, this third fugue has, by the breaking off point, completed its individual course as a smaller tributary or brook, which is what Bach means in German, and would have from this point on joined the quadruple fugue's unified stream. Incredibly intense and densely packed with ceaseless, highly charged chromatic modulations. This third sub fugue contains a single internal cadence that's unheard of. So much music without a cadence, a stopping point in box time, very unusual. So there's a single internal cadence which marks a turning point of almost mysterious import. Leading up to this cadence, one temporarily temporarily grounding the meandering paths of modulations in the local minor tonic of C, which is subdominant of the fugue's initial G minor. Bach steers his own vessel of harmonic explorations toward a dire region of slowly stirring, yet menacingly powerful turbulences, until it enters a small but fathomless viscous black whirlpool a harmonic maelstrom of ominously tugging forces, a possibly never before encountered chord. On your handout of the page which shows the few, I boxed that chord, so those of you who are comfortable reading music will know when I arrive there and when I approach it. All right, so. This is a possibly never before encountered chord, appearing within the barely insinuated momentary tonal context of the fugue's starting key, G minor, a chord that unfolds into an unlikely combination, the group of notes F sharp, A, E flat. These are, of course, commonly associated with the diminished seventh chord of G minor's leading tone with G's remote polar opposite, or tritone pair, in the form of a D flat. The D flat is not inside the box exactly because of tie, but if you look at the end of the previous line, there is the D flat appearing oh, yeah. in, the, in the top voice. And it's held over, so it's definitely sounding. Part of the reason why I chose this otherwise not very Bachish uh, timbre, you know, uh, jazz or electric piano or something, is that it has a nice sustain and it will hold the notes in our ears so that they come together, form the harmony, I will slow down there and it will still be fully present. I know Bach wouldn't approve of that tone color, but I think it will work for us. So that D flat, like an angel of doom sent from a dark, dimensionless tonal realm of singularity, this unexpected visitor from deep flatland casts a spell on our internal tonal compass. For a brief moment, the gravitational pull feels too overwhelming to escape. But to our surprised relief, the next moment finds us alive and well, back in G minor's reassuring, familiar tonal neighborhood, mm -hmm. with that C minor cadence that is at 10. What's most surprising is the sense that we have actually escaped nothing, that the black hole of atonality did momentarily swallow us up, but no sooner than it spewed us out with the same move into another tonal universe that's what white holes, white holes are supposed to be doing, according to astrophysicists, if they exist. So it spewed us out with the same move into another tonal universe, which unbelievably feels no different from our trusted home universe, except for this unerasable and incomprehensible bit of freak memory, which would insist that we have just been inserted into this here from a wholly other, yet from ours, hopelessly indistinguishable alternative here.
maybe I should do the first illustration now because this is heavy material and I said many things. I will stop right there at the point or just after that chord, then resume the reading and then play the whole thing one more time so that you have a better chance of feeling the way I'm suggesting you to feel. For those of you who care for such representations, there's a tonal diagram of the few. I'm hoping to return to it later, so I'm not going to burden you with its contents right now. But if you feel that is, even without my explanation, enlightening or helping, you can just hold it next to the score. And one eye here, the other there. It's easy. Especially if you're cross-eyed a little bit like I am. OK, so here we go. than what comes after the chord, but I'll play it again, so I slowed down, I, I hope you heard a little bit of what I'm on. But the music of the next few measures quickly disentangles us from the grip of this free flotsam from the only deeps of our memory, and we find ourselves experiencing a strange sequence of rapidly transforming feelings, heavy, sticky melancholy turning into a poignant sigh of relief and even into an inexplicable rush of exuberance, which then suddenly triggers in us this wave of barely expected lightness. One I can think of no better way of, of describing than through appealing to the disarmingly graceful title of the Czech writer Milan Kundera's famous novel, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. I want to stop here for a moment because since we will if you decide to come along, journey a little bit into physics today. There is a book written on particle physics by, how interesting, a writer whose name is also Czech sounding to me, so maybe he's quoting his own guy, you know? Wilczek is his last name, he's American. Uh, this particle physicist, physicist writes a book with the title, The Lightness of Being. And of course, he refers to this title. And his idea is that when you go down, you find nothing. Not substance, anyway. 
there is barely anything left we cannot, we, they, <laughs> cannot account for in terms of energy, movement, configurations, things we don't quite understand, but certainly not substance as we think of it. So matter turns out to be more like light, hence the lightness of being. That's a sidekick, but not quite inappropriate at this moment. Mm -hmm. So there's this unexpected feeling of lightness. The four voices engage each other in a dance of delight, exiting one grouping to enter another, then another, in ever-shifting and always fresh combinations. It is here, then, that we arrive at the first rendezvous among three subjects. The existence of the approaching fourth is, however, not a secret, nor, for that matter, are its destiny and identity. It is only natural that the entire cycle's ur subject, original subject, cannot be absent from the piece in which its journey of experiencing its inherent contrapuntal possibilities reaches its climax. The conditions are ripe now for its arrival as well as for its bonding with the others in exquisite quadruple counterpoint. And even though this event hides locked up into a future forever ejected from our own temporal orbit through existence, we can use the power of our imagination to experience its magic. In our present, if we leap, if we leap across the gap of the still unwritten and never completable fourth few, that's just what I am about to attempt in my demonstration, exploiting the similarity of the just-reached triple combination to one among the most likely fourfold configurations. I will use a slightly altered variant of Bach's final measures to short-circuit the present with a highly possible version of that elusive, fright future. So, if you follow, don't think I am making a mistake. I did very respectfully reconfigure box voices so that I could insert the fourth subject in a way that also does justice to his existing part. So I saved every voice, sorry, every not only every voice, every note of box, but combined it in a way that it also lines up with the fourth subject without raising the number of voices too high. So now I will play the, the whole thing again. Till the point where Bach stops writing. Why don't I switch to piano and see if that works a little better or at least differently?
would be a performance, I would continue with the next piece with this connection lead. I would like to show you another possibility right here, rather than later. We may never get to that point, but now I think it's time to do that. What do I mean by that? Can you hear me? Yes? yes. What do I mean by that, that we almost get tucked down to another realm, and that we actually did, but we are back? What would have happened in a more concrete way? Am I just making this up, or are these just nice metaphors, or could it actually happen? Yes, it could. That chord, that mysterious chord, is such that almost nothing, just a little shift of perspective needs to be done so that the voices all of a sudden end us up in a completely different key, which, which is what I metaphorically refer to as the black hole, as the deep place. There's a tritone relationship there, which we will get into. But let me show you what I mean. Which, uh, which timbre do you prefer, the piano or the previous? Yeah, this one. This one? Yes? OK, good. We'll stick with you. It's very uneven, and you know, wish I could do better, but that's, that's what we have. So I will pick it up from, let's see, let's see. Third line, count back three measures. And that's where I get going. actually proves how, how unnoticeable it would be if it happened that way. But I went to a completely different key. And the miraculous fact is that this can be done without torturing Bach or without doing injustice to the music. It is very much in the cards at the point. All right, so that was introducing the first piece. And now fast forward nearly 12 decades into a different kind of future. One we have long zoomed past, of course. So even as we together project ourselves into Bach's future, we have to reset the dial of our present about 14 decades into our past. As we arrive, we sense that the tonal black hole that the tonal black hole of that same viscous harmonic maelstrom has been tugging with a steadily growing force at another composer's vessel in the course of his own tonal explorations. Ever since he boarded the, the ghost ship of the Flying Dutchman, his first still somewhat roughly perfected or roughly fashioned imaginary doppelganger. Just recently he set sail yet again, this time to navigate his truly perfected latest legendary heroes toward their ill-fated destination. He created his personal version of Tristan and Isolde for the sole purpose of sending them into that unthinkable, yet by now inescapably approaching fathomless whirlpool. Through them, he hoped to live through what they are now facing on his behalf. He set his mind to immersing himself in their experience almost completely, but still vicariously, so that he may just barely escape their fate. 
Indeed, it was he himself who prepared the irresistible love potion they are about to consume, or rather, which is about to consume them. At this point, he drifted so close to the event horizon that he began sensing the thick black fluid of singularity stirring inside himself. <clears throat> and because despite his all-consuming curiosity, he dared not experience the fatal encounter firsthand, unlike Bach, who steered straight in fearlessly, eyes wide open with impassioned yet detached determination. Wagner poured all of his stirring, fear-ridden desire, all his dark passion, into the lover's potion. Brewed to unimaginable potency, then cunningly distilled to the last drop into sound, the deathly liquid filled the opening measures of the prelude to the Tristan. This living, quivering, drinking vessel and as we all know from our actual present perspective, the lovers drank their fill, as did along with them many of Wagner's younger contemporaries, among them Richard Strauss, Gustav Mahler, Arnold Schoenberg, with his two disciples, and the unnumbered host of later followers. What was in that group? It is high time for us to look into that cup with unclouded vision. For what was brewing in that cup then set some powerful currents into motion and is still brewing to this day inside all of us. The scholar in me wants to launch another dissertation on the Tristan Court, its origins and its unending interpretations, not to mention its controversial effects upon many composers, and upon the whole course of post-Wagner music history, like he once did when he conceived, when the scholar in me did, that is, my doctoral thesis about that formidable topic 20 years ago, and still never managed to voice my own timidly unfolding perceptions with any degree of clarity worthy of my present approval. It is time to look clearly and see lucidly what's in that chord and in Wagner's treatment of it against the backdrop of Bach's accomplishment. It is time also to unveil what later developments have transpired along a highly recognized but mostly ill-comprehended and unintegrated line of music historical unfoldment that took its clue besides other crucial influences from Bach's more than from Wagner's rather problematic inspiration, and arrive at an unprecedented widening of horizons. But I'm getting ahead of myself. As we reset our dial once again, we stand with Wagner and the lovers at the opening of the prelude and witness how he leaves them no room for preparation or hesitation, which he saves for himself, but plunges them into the maelstrom immediately. After only three groping notes that hesitantly evoke a tonal field we tend to accept as A minor, the very first harmony presents us with a different layout of the same configuration we described at the BACH fugue's turning point. Mm. F, B, G sharp, an outline of the leading tone diminished seventh chord. Combined with the tonic's tritone twin, this time cast in its sharp spelling, D sharp. It is true that Wagner casts a potent spell here through notational choices such as spelling, timbre mixing, subtle artifices of, artifices of rhythmic dynamic shading, and this D sharp doubtlessly plays its well calculated effect upon Isolde and Tristan and the rest of us. It conceals the black hole's dark event horizon by conjuring an ethereal luminescence around it in an attempt to mask its terrifying grip and to redress the force of its merciless suction into an irresistibly seductive attraction. Yet, contrary to current interpretations, when these outer layers of sophisticated lure and 
deception are pulled away. What remains is a uniquely configured functional harmony. Of course, not within common practice tonality, which is often characterized as function, as though other species of tonality lagged or at best approximated its functionality. Instead, this vertical sonority functions as a pivot, not between two keys, but between two forms, two significantly distinct stages of tonality. I believe it is a misunderstanding to see the Tristan chord as an agent of disintegration or some virus of histolysis. You know, histolysis when your tissues become disintegrated. That eats away at tonality's living tissue. Its exceptional transformative potency points into a direction that is quite different, even if in Wagner's and his followers' hands it was perceived as a harbinger of atonality. And its unparalleled force channeled to bring about that eventuality. Then what is that function? How does the Tristan chord in fact function? Let me play first, just to recall that opening, which many of you already know. Yeah. And it's just as well that this is not a, you know, the magician's full toolkit, that orchestra which could cast the spell of tone colors and all that, because we want to feel the, the bare effect mm -hmm. of those harmonies, especially the first chord, which is then sequentially transposed, reshaped, uh, actually three more times. The third, third is a little hidden, but it's definitely there. If you want to follow, on the same page where there's the diagram, yes. you can see those 17 measures. I skipped two measures which are very simple and don't really add anything. You will hear them, but just wait for the last two measures which I will. melody never stops for a second, never cadences, never lets you breathe. The harmony, first encountered by Bach and later rediscovered, by, rediscovered but never fully integrated by Wagner, although it may forever remain to be remembered as the Tristan chord, is then a half-diminished seventh naturally associated with the diatonic root best described as T, but erected upon Fa as its root. If the sentence I just uttered didn't seem to answer a question you haven't even considered before just now, 
that's quite natural. It's a statement that will seem and remain scholarly and theoretic and obscure until it is brought alive within a context that we recognize as vitally relevant for us. This is the switching point. This is where my written text was given up and I wanted to see if I can continue in live presentation. First of all, there is yet another bit of music, of music history that I would like to flash for you. And uh, since there is a chance that you haven't heard it or not in its entirety, and given that it is at this point way too difficult for me to try to play it, maybe later when I will be big, I will try, but not as yet. Uh, we will, uh, with Liza's wonderful help, play it from a recording. However, let me just say a, a few things about it so that we can, we can listen with more preparation. So this is the piece uh, that in the lecture title I refer to in the first line as music. You see those three words there, B-A-C-H, that you know what it means, right? Tristan, that refers to, obviously, the chord and all that. The last word says music. I don't mean music in general, even though to me it is, and to us, his fellow Hungarians, it has always seemed like this is a title which couldn't express better the fact that this piece of music is just emblematic of music's possibilities, its depth, its ability to put us in touch with our unknown selves and with some cosmic knowledge that is somehow in us. So the full title of the piece is I want to show you the score. Uh, music for string instruments, percussion, and celesta. Music, for short. The first movement is Andante Tranquillo. It is a slow... How should I call it? A castle or a cathedral of sound. Uh, that is cast in the, in the shape, in the form of a fugue. Bach decided to write a fugue which reveals the potentialities in fugue structure that were not possible to develop within the context of 18th century or even 19th century music. He took his clue from uh, Bach, I'm sure, and probably from this fugue that we have just experienced in particular, in that with the fugue entries he does not stop at the usual tonic dominant, tonic dominant subject answer interplay in the exposition, and then add to it entries in a few other related keys, which can be quite a few and quite adventurous, however never systematically exploring what we call, don't get scared if you haven't heard it before, the circle of fifths. The, the universe of the 12 tones that divide up the octave turn out to be not arbitrary divisions. They are not just simply culturally sanctioned things that we are used to and some other cultures may be used to. There's an underlying structure which in its absolute compelling simplicity almost makes it inevitable that not in all of its flowerings, but musical forces could never get away from the blueprint of this configuration called the circle of fifths, which really is a spiral, as it turns out, but for all practical purposes and the way we represent it in our tuning system, it is a closed circle. So then Bartok's fugue entries start in the central A. I even hesitate to say that it is Bartok's tonic because I think that the concept of tonality is too narrow to do justice to these concepts. It's almost a subdominant in my mind, if anything. That's also a limited concept. And I believe that there is not only tonality but also subdominality. 
there is also dominality. I know these are funny words, but perhaps I can tell you what I mean by them. Perhaps not today. However, from the central A, the entries fan out in two directions. Right. So if you represent the circle of fifths as increasing in your clockwise direction, yes, then it would be ascending fifths, even though this seems to be descending, which then come full circle. You can also depict it, of course, in terms of descending fifths. Fifths can also be replaced by fourths as well as other transpositions, doesn't matter. And then that would go in the counterclockwise direction, and that's exactly what the entries do. So from the A entry, the second one is in E, the third in B, the fourth in B, the fifth in B. Did I say B here? It's what I say again. I'm confused because of the switch. So A, E, D, B, G, F sharp, C. Right now we are at the middle of the circle, mm -hmm. F sharp and C are opposite to each other di di diametrically. And so it goes, I will not burden you with all the names, but you know them anyway, any of you. The entries keep going, there's a switch, there's a, a change in step, so to speak, at some point. Also it is interesting, let me insert here before I move on, that when Bartok reaches that entry, that pair of entries, the B and the G, then he stops for a moment and he gives an episode, few set episodes, which don't contain the subject. His few doesn't have many. You could see another part as episodic, but even there, the presence of the subject is very strong. There's an episode here, so that's already interesting that he would do that. However, what's next is the F sharp C entries. And the way the F sharp C entries are presented is in close follow-up. It's not just simply a canonic imitation, like around the canon does, but a very close-up imitation. Only two notes is the C entry behind the F sharp entry. That perhaps shows something. Perhaps it shows that just about this place in the circle of fifths has been traditionally the limit of tonality. Not that we couldn't venture below it, but that venturing has never really been until a little after the Christian court truly ventured. It was just you know holding on to the real tonality up there and maybe going and exploring the deep. So maybe that's what that's what uh, that strato entry, as we say, as we call it in, in music, that close-up imitation represents. What it represents then is that these notes in our perception somehow form a, a pair which is unclear in its relationship. It seems to be disturbing but at the same time almost identical. They are vying with each other, they are dissonant, that's the, the interval of a tritone, but they are also almost like the edges of the visible, experienceable universe. Light rays bend, and so that's why we cannot get a clear statement. This kind of short circuit. Beyond this entry, the following entries are never complete. They are fragmentary, which still shows our relationship to this area as sort of like a shadow ground. But Bartok does push these entries until, in their alternation, they reach the point which is now opposing diametrically the starting point up there, which is A, or as you will see in that diagram, La, it uses the Spanish note names. Uh, but that is still the same thing. So opposite A or La is E flat, or Mi bemol in Spanish. And interestingly, although that diagram doesn't show it and most people don't notice it, there are actually two entries on that E flat. That is highly significant. I don't think that it is just a coincidence. Bartok meant to tell us that the open, sorry, that the circle of fits is actually an open circle. 
and this point doesn't really match. It doesn't really close. Rather, these, these two branches of fits kind of overshoot the target, and they leave a little bit of a gap, which if we did justice to in our tuning, if we played it that way, it would be a very disturbing dissonant, almost like someone playing glaringly out of tune. However, that's not the point of it. The point of it is not to be exposed to the dissonance and its problems in physical performance. The point is something that resonates with us inside. Our consciousness recognizes these configurations, not only because we have listened to music. It is the music behind the music. It is the music in us which, which makes these interesting collections of physical sounds immediately something meaningful and touching to us. In that inner realm, that gap, what we refer to as the comma, there are different kinds of commas, this is what we refer to as the Pythagorean comma, that is crucial because without that, the circle would remain a circle. It would never do that, what I mentioned, opening up into a spiral. So at that point, it's apparent that Bartok reaches something crucial. Not only is he giving us two hints of entries, one for each version of the pitch, but also the music culminates every instrument's close encounter in that single pitch in their different registers. Everybody's pounding on an E flat mm -hmm. in a way that is dramatic to say the least. Mm -hmm. Now, how does this belong into this Tristan story? There is no Tristan portrait. Bartok finds there what is truly there, what's in the center of the Tristan portrait. And what remains there, I believe, is the black hole, which I now tentatively equate with that gap, with that comma. And because his plunging is, his diving, his deep diving is even more courageous, than Box, not because Bach was not courageous enough, but because the conditions were not right for him to make that switch which I illustrated. He was aware of it. It was just pointless to explore that direction because it would have brought up possibilities that only Bartok could tackle. Post Wagner, post Brahms, post everything that happened up to then. List Richard Strauss, I WC, I should list really every important name and, and the invisible and unheard of trends in music history, not to mention the great influence from folk music, from Eastern European folk music. So Bartok was in a position to tackle that, and he did. That's why I'm showing it to you. It may not happen today that I can reveal how I think that is the true resolution of the problem of the Tristan court, much more so than Schoenberg's and his followers' atonal resolution. I may not be able to show that, but let's see how far we can go. Now, after those two entries, there are two more entries on the E-flat note. They're barely discernible because, because of the fragmentation that's going on. God, that's going on. However, Bartok's idea is something that relates to the BACH fugue, BACH fugue very intimately, is that after these first two entries, he flips his subject, his fugue subject, upside down. Mm -hmm. And from this point on, with the next two entries on the same node, separated by the gap, he is going to continue presenting us with the inverted, upside-down version of the subject. Bach actually also did that in the BACH view. There are inverted entries. Also, if you look at the diagram, or you did, or you will later, you don't have to, just believe me, you trust me, his, his right-side-up entries either start on B-flat or on F. These are a fifth apart, as they should be in a few. Or of you. However, the inverted entries, 
turn out to begin on E and on A. The first of this pair of notes, B flat, and the first of the other pair of notes, E, B flat E, forms a tritone pair. And I should show it maybe here. So that's Bach's version of presenting the same idea of the structure that Bartok spells out completely. There is also another connection, which at this point is not yet something I refer to in any way, but it's not a coincidence that the other entry of the right side up subject, which is F, connects with the other entry of the upside down subject, which was A. So that F-A connection is also crucially important. That's a major third. And it's a major third that is, now I'm going back to this representation in my strange dance of showing things in the air. So if here are the tritone pairs, that's where Bartok brought his strato, tritone strato, you remember? Then those two notes, which Bach also highlights with his two other entries, would correspond to the state, the stations, one above this half line, right here. Mm -hmm. Even though in Bach's design those are not the same notes, but never mind, because it's the configuration that counts. If in the middle there is G rather than A, then of course F and A belong to this point. Now this point is exactly one-third of the circle, with two-thirds exactly meeting in, in the midpoint below here. So that's a very interesting symmetrical configuration and highly significant. On his way back, Bartok, when he introduces the inverted entries, he reaches one more time the tritone axis. I want to call it an axis for a good reason. Here he engages again in that strato that he did previously. But he still just gives us a fragment of the subject, not the full subject. Actually, on one of those pages, two of those pages, if you turn around the, the handouts as you were looking at it, you will see pairs of pages from Bartok's score. One of those shows these entries, which are located right here, on the way out as well as the strato entry. The other pair of pages shows the place where the strato entry appears again, but now still fragmentary, as if Bartok was trying to tell us. The new significant, the newly discovered, rediscovered configuration is not the fourfold configuration of the axes. That is still there, still important. The important one is now this triangular configuration. And that he shows clearly by the fact that the first complete entries on the way back of the inverted subject are in strato, in those two keys, based on those two notes, which correspond to these two points. That's what I'm also showing on that page. So if you are good at reading scores and that helps you, you might want to follow. I will cue you when the first pair of pages begins in the music as we play it, and when the second pair of pages does. If not, just, just listen and without any concern for the structure that is too technical for you, just get the effect because that is much more important. Let's see, what else do I need to say before we launch? I think that should be enough. There could be more interesting parallelisms pointed out with the Bach view, but I will not go overboard. The only thing I might want to do is play once the subject, we will hear it there so you are more prepared, and it's inversion as well. Mm -hmm. And then we will listen, and we will be actually following it on a diagram, which is not perfect. It doesn't show all the details I would like it to. It also skips certain important entries, but at least it guides our vision through the journey sufficiently. Also, it is in Spanish, so for some of you that may be welcome. Okay, so the subject. Thank you so much for being here with us.
and I chose to give you the version of both based on A as the starting node because when the two trajectories meet up here in A, that's exactly what Barthog does for us. He presents in absolute alignment, not just a close follow, but an absolute temporal alignment, the two versions of the shot subject, the upside down and the right side up. They are at the two far edges of a texture which in the mirror shows us, in the middle rather, shows us a mirror-like surface, like a ruffled water surface. That is what the celesta, the strange instrument, is mm. doing. It creates this glassy, yes. mirror-like surface, and then you feel how the subject looks into that mirror and sees itself upside down. All right, that's experience. So this event has been graciously offered to me by the two visionary creators of this series, my friend Larry, who unfortunately cannot be here today, and her wonderful wife Liza, not very long ago my student, but now my teacher in creative musicianship, dedication, humility, excellence, and many, many more things. Offered to me, as I say, to give a presentation just about any topic that happens to excite me currently and which I would gladly share with any and all who would honor me this afternoon with their presence. Well, it is you, all of you, now facing me. My text here says, and possibly a few more who are yet to arrive, but I don't believe people will be that late anymore. So it is you who turned out to be those people. I must acknowledge that you all have performed a remarkable leap of faith by being here, and I would like to reward you for this in kind. I myself decided, and that was a risky decision in a way, to enact a veritable leap of faith in my choice of what subject I would attempt to address, and more importantly, how I would do that. I used to think of myself primarily as a scholar of music, a musicologist. I no longer do. Simply, wow, you see, I'm glad I read that little phrase there. Thank you for coming, guys. So I just said that I'm very appreciative that you guys came here to listen to me, and I think that that's a veritable act of faith on your part, and I would like to do the same for you in return. And what I'm doing also takes a lot of faith and a lot of courage on my part. So I used to think of myself as a musicologist, but I no longer do simply because scholarship, as it is commonly understood and practiced, does not excite me as much as it used to. Music still does, more than it ever has. So therefore, I will now launch the vessel of my thought onto an uncharted sea of meaning that has remained largely opaque to our rather clueless, collectively self-imprisoned intellect. I have long I've long since sensed certain crucial configurations of gestalts of significance within this neglected sea of meaning to which I believe only music can provide for us anything resembling direct access. I'm convinced, in other words, that it is only by focusing attention upon some archetypal aspects of music's universal organizational patterns through the lens of certain carefully chosen specific phenomena within our musical heritage in the West, in which, from our cultural perspective at least, those aspects seem to converge and culminate, that we can hope to unlock those deeper configurations for our comprehension. I invite you on this journey, but with this warning. The outcome is entirely unpredictable. 
And I mean this because when I say I launch my vessel now, I refer not only to this moment you and I jointly inhabit here, but also to a now that is at this point nine days in our past, on the day of this year's fall equinox. Mm. And as I conceive these very words, I truly have no clear idea as to how it will all turn out. There are no guarantees. I have taken the risk and liberty to do this because this venue this kind of Saturday afternoon event doesn't connote for me a buttoned-up lecturing atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing a tie, but you say I'm not buttoned up. Oh, I'm not lying here. I just like ties. One of my weaknesses. So this place and time, this is a place and time, rather, to unveil new fruits of creativity. I might have done that here more than once before. And that's what I will attempt once again today. Not through a recent musical composition of mine, but by tackling a musical and at the same time also meta-musical puzzle that I haven't quite figured out yet. But hope to do so with the very help of your own leap of faith. Will you stay on board? If you do, then let the journey begin. Let me insert at this point that I turned out to be very right about this. As I was working feverishly on this, after many, many weeks of thinking, of course, but trying to commit it to a format which I can then read to you, somewhere around the fifth day, I have doubts that I can keep on going and write this to the end and still be able to read it to you. I realized that many things that in writing, even if it is not formal, even if it is not scholarly in the ways I describe, things have to be clear, things have to, like what you write down, you feel you're very responsible about. And yes, this approach, this, this, uh, experiment is so experimental that I realized if I want to be able to convey some of it faithful, I will have to stop the writing because that doesn't take me there. I will read and do my stuff as I planned up to a certain point, then stop there and depending on how we all are doing, we'll keep going without the written text and see how far that takes us. Before setting sail, let me introduce and describe in some detail those notable moments of Western music history I have in mind. Being as they are relatively familiar to most of us present, that's an assumption on my part, so correct me if it's not so, they will best serve for anchoring our attention and help poise our vessel for launching. Bach's unforgettable, unfinished fugue on the letters of his name is the first. Contrapunctus number 14 was planned as the crowning achievement of Bach's unsurpassed art of fugue, an ambitious synthesis into a single fourfold movement of four distinct fugues, each based on its own subject, designed for ultimate combining with the other three. I didn't destroy that. I'll be more careful. I'll just show you quickly the subject. The first is... This is not directly on your page. That's the first. Could you hear it? Yes. Uh, the second one is... you will hear soon because this is our subject. The last one, as it turns out, it's not proposed, it's not in the score, I will say more about that, but it was supposed to be the subject, which is 
the master subject of the entire collection of fugues. And that is... Sorry, the touch on these keyboards is very unpredictable. You can't really fine-tune your dynamics easily. Thank you, Liza. Because time will definitely not permit us to follow anywhere near close to where I am now, and where I am now is not where we should be. <laughs> I will say as much as I can a few things so that you don't remain completely dangling midair, you know, left clueless. What I discovered in the Bach fugue is that in his way, with his tools that were available to him, Clearly, even though subtly, Bach reaches the same conclusion. After the dipping, not only does he come back, not only is it a matter of what the music sounds like, how it unexpectedly lightens up, it actually reflects a crucial discovery made in the depths. It's as if, to use the terminology I am playfully using here, or suggesting here, it's not just that the black hole turns out to be its mirror image, it's opposite. And a white hole becoming a white hole, which is a very interesting concept, by the way. Let me just quickly insert here um, how the black hole is something that you can only enter and never exit. The white hole is that you can only exit and nothing can enter it. But they have the same interior with a crucial difference and that interior is mysterious and only theoretically explored and we are not even sure if any telltale signs out there actually tell us that there are white holes, there may be, there may be not but quoting from the Wikipedia article a 2011 paper argues that the Big Bang itself is a white hole hmm. swallow so that one a 2014 paper explored the idea, that idea, in the framework of a five-dimensional vacuum. So the exploration feels the need for more dimensions here. That's also a very important clue for us. Now, coming back from that quick glance out there or in here, you know, the discovery is about that configuration, that triangular configuration, which does not reveal itself until the much-resisted flip happens. Why is that flip resisted so much? Why did musicians throughout the centuries knew well, very well, about equal temperament, which gets rid of commas and all sorts of interesting, you know, hard to handle relationships? Mm -hmm. Not because they didn't understand that it could be done and it would be very practical, but because they felt that that would mean the same thing. It would mean that that perfect circle, like a kaleidoscopic, frightful, symmetrical configuration, will make us lose, you know, it's the feeling of vertigo. In, in spatial dimensions, we don't feel, you know, happy about being turned around with eyes closed and feeling confused and we don't know where left and right is, or front and back, or in the drive and there's no GPS yet because we are back there and you get lost in a city because you don't know where west and east and that's not a good feeling but but it's okay what you don't ever want is lose balance what what does losing balance mean it means that your vertical dimension can no longer be surely assigned as above me and as below me we are constantly negotiating gravity and gravity wants us to go down there and if you go down there far enough in free fall quick enough mm -hmm. you don't know where up or down is you're weightless weightlessness we can imagine is a exhilarating feeling but i think that the panic the vertigo, vertigo that comes with it is even more deeply ingrained in our psyche now this seems like a very strange metaphor okay i'm talking about gravity and 
ups, ups, and down, but how does it relate to the circle field that's, after all, just an abstract configuration? Maybe it is not. Maybe it says more about the structure of being, both physical and conscious. I guess we are approaching our time's end here, right? Maybe not. Time. Ten minutes. This is so loaded, there is so much I could be saying, but I will, I will try to. So they close at 6, so they won't be here up until 6 for this game? Uh, I am, you know how, how I can al always go on forever, but it is also about you and your, your plans and your comfort level. So maybe we will feel it out, but be honest and you know, shoot me down that it's just too much to take in. Anyhow, Bartok's solution, which Bach could only insinuate with his own tools, was that the fourfold configuration, when it becomes fully symmetrical, fully available with all its all possibilities, instead of extinguishing itself into a tonality, because now everything is everywhere, and there is no way of distinguishing among the stations of that 12 fold circle. Instead of that, we rediscover an underlying configuration, which this is a relatively recent discovery for me as well, which in fact does not come from the same roots, the same causal source that the 12 fold configuration we know as the circle of fifths does. That one now I'm increasingly pointing in this direction, so I will turn this in, is based on certain frequency ratios that correspond to the powers of three. In the handout you saw my minus three, plus three, those strange numbers, those actually refer to the, the mathem mathematical underlying structure of those entries. So, in other words, you could, you could see a circle of fifths in different ways, but one of the very compelling and very relevant ways is to see the topmost position as the zero power of three, and then you would have a positive realm in which the positive powers of three unfold, and we hear those as equally increasing increments in intervals, but they are actually increments in dimensions, perhaps not just mathematical dimensions outward, externally, whereas the other arc goes into the negative power realm, you could say, by hitting the negative first power of three, that would be one, one third, the negative square of nine. And then by octave adjustment, because this whole system is a result of of the interface between the powers of two, the doubles and halves, which represent a strange sense of musical quasi-identity for us, sameness. And so it creates a modulo spinal column, so to speak, modulo as a mathematical modulo, right? Yeah. Modulo, yes, I didn't say it there. But you understand it now? So around that, that axis, so to speak, or that, that pole, the snake of the spiral of fits, turns, and wriggles downward and upward. And it becomes circular or spiral-like because there are always points of near hit, of approximation, with the powers of two, never complete, but ever improving and ever more closely approximating. So then, steering back to what Bartok found there, I now believe that the configuration which so compellingly overrides the fourfold frightful symmetry, seemingly leading to your, your calling you to your death, <laughs> in the black hole, what he found there was that triangular or threefold configuration, which I believe now comes from a mathematically even more fascinating source. But more importantly, that source is not mathematic. It 
can be represented in using twi twitching mathematics in certain ways very, very revealingly and very amazingly, but I believe that it's actually the dynamic of our internal consciousness. When I say our, I mean every object that I'm surrounded with, every atom, every living or so-called not living being, as well as human being. Bartok's system is not yet adequately understood. Mm -hmm. System is not a good word. The sort of expanded tonality that he, not alone by the way, but perhaps in the most, in the way that has most consequence for mm -hmm. present, future, and so forth. But along with him, Messiaen definitely mm -hmm. discovered the same in principle, handled it differently, but is in the same ballgame. Jazz, in its own way, discovered the same. Yeah. And so did many other giant steps. Yes, these are. So what this is, uh, people approach from different angles. The familiar to us approach would be to talk about three octatonic scales. There are only three of those. Octatonic scales consist of alternating half and whole steps. Eight notes fit within the octave in that way. And between the possible combinations that exhaust the 12-fold resource, all three of them have said everything that could be said. And those three octatonic scales, which Messiaen calls them the modes of limited transposition in his system, give rise to some of the aspects of this tonality, but not all. Another approach, which is a very, very remarkable one, but not very well known outside of Hungary, because it was conceived by a Hungarian scholar, Ernő Lendvoi, is his name. He translated much of his work into Hungarian, into English, not very successfully. The publications are not easy to fine, so they didn't make a splash, no? Unfortunately. He has also his problems. I will quickly tell you what his idea is. He says that this tonality should be known as, or called, or conceived as axial tonality. Why? Because it turns out that <clears throat> the relationship which historically only connected maybe notes which are separated by a quarter slice of the circle of fifths, and then later as it expanded by diametric tritone connections, and then even extended into the other realm to do the same quaternal slicing. These relationships, when they spread all around, they end up projecting over the whole span of the circle of fifths the three crucial components of tonality, which are the functions. So function doesn't go away that easy. However, there are problems with that. What, what does Landway mean by function? Of course, he refers to tonic dominance of dominant. Now, his idea can be visualized, I hope, quite compellingly by looking at this wheel here. I will try to speak loud enough. Do you see those? Uh, Uh, what's the, the Nazi symbol? Swastika. Well, swastika more than, than uh, can't think of the name. What cross? Uh, anyway, don't get scared. Cross. They are swastika. Yes. Look at any one color. For instance, the blue. See the swastika? Mm. In the white note system using these nodes, this would correspond to the subdominant axis, which are always at the crucial um, getting tired numbers that don't come to me the four directions, right? Cardinal, Cardinal thank you. Of of tonalities zodiac, if you so what happens is 
Well, how do we get an F major? We connect F to the A here. That's actually a triangular connection, right? There. Then we include the fifth of the F, which really belongs to another axis, but it is included in the subdominant axis. And that gives us the F major chord. The minor chord uses B here and the same A. And then you can combine them. That's the famous 265 chord in a major key. That's definitely a subdominant configuration. But then the thing extends, you know, with with French six and German six, B comes into the picture with its fifth, which is F sharp, and so does G sharp with the Tristan chord as well as before, with its fifth. It's a completely symmetrical extension of all the notes that make up that function. And then if you look at the the green cross with its swastika arms, that would be the tonic axis. And when you look at the red, that would be the dominant axis. Now, Landway's approach is very insightful because with this conception, he can now recognize configurations in very seemingly confusing guises, you know. It doesn't only recognize octatonic scale segments as melodic resources. He recognizes vertical entities, chords, which are not nearly as simple as our triadic or four notes, or even if it's expanded by jazz and whatnot. These are sometimes, you know, eight note combinations. He labels the different possibilities as alpha, as beta, you know, how scholars do that stuff. And in those configurations, he discovers how the tendencies of expanding tonality beyond the breaking point, rather than leading to atonality, although they did that too, they lead to these completely spread out, beefed up versions of, of these functional complexes. There's a problem with his interpretation, which is exactly its perfect symmetry. How will you distinguish ever between the effect, the sound effect of subdominant, who says so? I can decide that you know, red is subdominant, and then everything shifts. So what makes the difference between them palpable? If Bartok's actual living organism, living system, was limited to that, then there would be no function remaining. So he calls this axial tonality. It's very interesting that the old tonality, which we recognize as functional, can be likened to the functions of syntax, right? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty convincing. You could say tonic is something like the subject, the object, the things that can be named in a sentence. Dominant corresponds to the predicative function, mm -hmm. which has agency, which has force in it. Mm -hmm. And the two come together to form an entity, a higher level entity, and that corresponds maybe to the subdominant, which is always the encompassing, defining, the limits and the center sort of entity. So it's very compelling to look at it that way. That syntactic tonality, you could say. So syntaxis, when you cut it differently, it also includes axis, right? So how does Bartok's system become syntaxial? That's what Landway doesn't quite get, or at least if he understands, he never lets us know. Now, he says interesting things, which again are intriguing beyond belief to me, always have been, but I've never really found them convincing. And these are the puzzles I'm trying to bring to you and partially maybe address. One of the things that he does when he, you know, projects his X-ray vision to this configurations, to this configuration, is to discover that depending on a certain arrangement that he finds very, not only characteristic of the Western tradition, but also very telling about the folk music influences that Bartok mm. incorporated, is to show the connections along pentatonic, typical pentatonic terms. Mm. Pentatonicism tends to use lots of fourths, 
inside the fourth minor second, uh, uh, sorry, minor third and an old step. That also takes us back to Greek music theory, of course, you know, the Petrochor. And he says that from these connections, we can build up these configurations. One way of doing that, uh, to take those notes of the subdominant axis, it's a D. So it's a D, A, B, F sharp. Now up here I'm showing you G sharp, B sharp. Bye. Thank you so much for being here. G sharp, B sharp. arrangement, you definitely see the perfect chords, major, second, minor, thirds, even the minor sixths. These are very characteristic intervals in forming it. And if you arrange it like I did, you will even discover a minor ninth. And that way suggests that these are the key intervals. He says, these intervals reveal their meaning if you count the semitones in each of those intervals and you will discover that from the major seconds two, because it's two half steps, right? Through the minor thirds, three. Going on to the perfect fourths, five. Fifth half step. And then expanding into the minor sixth, eight, eight half steps, and reaching the minor ninths, thirteen half steps. We are discovering here the great secret, which is what? Two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one, the Fibonacci numbers. Right. Now, Fibonacci numbers and their implication, the golden section, the golden proportion or the divine proportion or the golden mean, you know, that very mysterious ratio, which is an irrational number combined with perhaps some rational numbers, is, I've, all, I've always been convinced, very crucial to Bartok's art. When you look at the temporal layout of his work, every, if we analyze that subject, which I do in my dance class, it takes a full class. It gives you amazing Fibonacci points at crucial climactic points and yes. the praise member. Everything that is relevant musically will be placed strategically in the Fibonacci universe. And probably it is not even Bartok's painstaking calculation. I would say not at all. He may have adjusted here and there, but the nature of the music definitely breathes Fibonacci, Fibonacci proportions and ratios. So it is appropriate, but I find a hard time saying or accepting that the true origin of the axis as such is the Fibonacci pool. Why? Because if I rearrange those intervals in just as convincing and just as relevant ways, still showing the same eight pitches, but now in a different way, I will not get Fibonacci numbers at all. Here is another possibility. Very relevant, obviously. Look at you know the major chords expanding into dominant sevens. hands I could hit that all and you would get the same alpha. Now here you have typical intervals of major third, perfect fifth, this is four semitones, seven semitones, minor seventh, the dominant seventh, which would be ten semitones. What did I skip? That is important. All of them, the, the minor second, they are not Fibonacci ratios. 
So there is something there, but not what he says, and not for the reason. So that kept intriguing. Now, because we are definitely running out of energy and attention and, and time as well, I will try to summarize things and kind of regroup, reconfigure. Let me go right at the at the crux of the matter. The relationships of the powers of two will not give rise to the powers of three until the powers of two, which come from a way from a place and from a definition where they were not yet powers of two in the way we define it, but until they actually are conceived as being either negative or positive. For that to happen, I'm saying this uh, with much reason and I gave it much thought and I hope to elaborate or uh, lay it out in a way that everyone can clearly understand it. But the powers of two will not give rise to the powers of three until interspersed with the never-ending powers of two enters an other set of doubles and halves which exactly dovetails with the powers of two and that would be every other power of square root two square root two also corresponds to the tritone the exact middle of the octave and it is also an irrational entity. In a mysterious way, the underlying dynamic of not yet manifest, I will break and call it consciousness, can give rise to this. That underlying configuration is potentially triangular or threefold, symmetrically threefold. I will give you a, a hint how that can be. Before actual quantities, quantities are only representations, abstract representations of entities. Okay. So before quantizable bits of existence, I believe that what preceded quantity was power. Power pretty much as we use it in mathematics. So before there was something to be raised to such and such negative or positive power, there were three, potentially three different, but yet not yet distinguished realms, power realms. The golden ratio is probably as close as we can come to that configuration when we want to grasp it with our mind, which is already out in the manifested realm of quantities. Why? The golden ratio is absolutely unique in the whole universe of mathematics as we know it, in that its zero power and its negative first power exactly adds up to its first positive power. When we represent the golden section, we usually say 1, of course, is the zero power. Then phi, as we usually symbolize it in mathematics, a big phi, you know, Greek letter. Phi corresponds to 1.6180, and the numbers oh, no. keep going on and on. Whereas the first negative power is 0 0.618, and the same sequence of digits. So you see what I say is completely simply. So, this is the only geometrical sequence, you know, power sequence, or exponential sequence, as opposed to arithmetic or harmonic mathematical sequences. The only one which is also additive, which otherwise characterizes arithmetic sequences. That's why the Fibonacci series or sequence of whole numbers 
so faithfully approximates, as you go higher and higher, that ratio. And the Fibonacci obviously is, you know, the first two members added together produce the third. The second and the third, the sum of them produces the fourth. So it's an additive system. Now with the actual ratio of the phi, that additivity is still there. Now, why is that important? Because in the in the first three powers, the zero, first negative, and the first positive, we have a configuration that is complete in itself, completely closed. It doesn't seem to need a continuation. With any other power sequence, you will never find that. This is getting a little too, probably, you know, too uh, much to swallow, but it's fascinating how when that underlying situation of three indistinguishable power realms without any quantities yet, when it gives rise to the double, before it allows it to unfold into its now separated positive and negative realms and thereby give rise to three and its powers with the agency of the tritone of the intervening other octave line the two of which by the way produces exactly that cross skeleton of the circle of hits before that the golden ratio when it unites with the newly born double ratio, it gives rise to, a, to another circle. And amazingly, that circle contains, before it first meets with the double, like the powers of three meet with the double, right? The first time it happens is after or at the 36th power of the golden of five. So in other words, the, the golden mean octave, if you will, consists of 36 divisions. And the way it is laid out is actually in ever-shifting triangles. So that each time you go through the whole span in, a, in an asymmetrical, but very resembling an equilateral triangle configuration, and shift to the next. And you end up with three triangles moving across their own 12-fold circle of fifths. So the circle of fifths is actually predated by something that results in the same 12-fold division of the octave, but yet does not result from fifths. So the short version of I, what I was trying is a completely impossible task to, to say here is this. At certain stages of unfoldment, existence, physical, as well as musical existence, pushes developments and unfoldments to their limit where they have to enter a point where they disappear in a black hole. They come out in a white hole. That's how they appeared in the first place. And they re-establish connection with the deep realm in which the third principle reveals itself. And its configuration which saves the fourfold configuration for collapsing into itself and leading to atonality and meaninglessness and death and end of the world and big crunch and it's called physics. So I suggest that we close absolutely inadequately and yet in a way that allows us to breathe and when we leave we will not feel completely crazy is I would like to give you two quotes. One is from a physicist, Evan Harris Walker, died 10 years ago, who is not recognized by the rest of the physicist community because he goes too far in the direction of exploring consciousness and its role in physics. Mm. However, he is pretty substantial. I will quote him and then I will quote a 13th century Christian mystic, a woman, who I believe expresses the first stage of what I call diatonality, its unfoldment, as its first, first uh, 
interesting forms, Western music, and then develops into these very complex configurations and turning points with a metaphor. That metaphor will be very telling based on the few things that I already hinted at. So without further ado, I will read those two quotes and you will make out of them whatever you want and curse me for the rest of the weekend and, and the month and your life. But that's what I am, so that's what I brought to you. Here is one of them. I will only make one comment. I promise it will be relatively short. So Walker says towards the end of his book, when he has already revealed his major solutions to the problems of quantum physics and, and the problem of the measurement, right, measurement problem, how consciousness has to be there at every quantum mechanical level. So he says a lot remains to be done. String theories, super string theories, and super gravity hypotheses exist. I doubt that the answers lie in those directions, except somewhat incidentally. I think here he makes a mistake, because to me the most amazing clue from physics is the fact that super string theory presupposes the existence of 11 extended dimensions. That's the only way its mathematics can work. Now, there is one dimension that is not extended, zero dimension. So, physicists have tumbled or stumbled upon sorry, a 12 fold configuration of dimensions which move across an infinity of Hilbert space dimensions, but always retain their configuration. And within the 12, a four fold subset is what gives rise to our perceivable space time dimensions. So, that is not so unimportant as he says, but still, what he says is starting. I think the direct path to an understanding of all the forces of nature, all the particles and interactions, is to be discovered by understanding what observation and consciousness are all about, and understanding the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. In particular, I think the answer arises out of a very elementary equation that has two terms, a space-time operator and an information term operating on the state vector. The information term is a binary mathematical term. It is always the powers of two. That's how information is always measured. That's just another hint for us that there may be a real connection there, right? This is the form we get if we merely say that we observe events. Or even more simply, conscious observation exists. This requires that something be observed that we can most simply and symmetrically assume to be assumed to be of the same form as the observer. There is an observer-observed duality that is also exactly the same thing if viewed from the other side, the observed side. Then the original observer becomes the observed, and the observed, the observer. This is the all-symmetrical foundational configuration behind what will become dominant tonic inside the embrace of the towel. <laughs> so dominant. The information input selects the states, which gives us the change in the states. And that process is the origin of space-time. That space-time has an indefinite number of pieces of what has already been seen, particles, pieces of information, the pieces of matter that you and I are made of. This dualistic idealism lies at the very core of existence. It is the loom that weaves the fabric of reality, and behind the loom, the quantum mind. So we at last find that reality is the observer observing. It is the two parts of our great separation coming together. There is a separation. There is a dreadful and vast separation, but there is no space and really no matter to die, but that our own minds did not first come together to create. Our observation, our coming together, created matter. Observation itself is the stuff of the space that reaches out past the vast clusters of galaxies. Reality is the fruit of love's embrace. 
now Mechthild of Magdeburg, 13th century. You know, he talks about God and Christian terminology, but here what she's saying, we could just really start talking beginning with this. We will not, I promise. This will be the ending. Effortlessly, love flows from God into man. Like a bird who rivers the air without moving her wings. In the upper half of the circle of this, maintaining its balance. Thus we move in his world, one in body and soul, though outwardly separate in form. As the source strikes the note, humanity sings. The Holy Spirit is our harpist, and harps are really lyres that have seven or nine strings. So this is very relevant here. The Holy Spirit is our harpist, and all strings which are touched in love must sound. So we have to stop here, and I really appreciate your, your absolute loyal attention. I'm sorry if I disappointed you. I disappointed myself, for sure, because the most beautiful and most important realizations had to remain closed. But hopefully it starts something for more than just me. Thank you very much.